Good evening. Um, welcome to the New School. My name is Karen Kuoni. I'm the director of the Viralist Center for Art and Politics here at the New School. And I'm delighted to welcome you to How Obscene Is This? The Decency Clause Turns 20. It is a particular honor, almost a necessity, to consider this rather appalling anniversary in collaboration with the National Coalition Against Censorship. For almost 40 years, the coalition has influenced the debate around free speech and censorship in this country and has produced innumerable educational, political and media tools to preserve the fundamental human right of freedom of expression. We're fortunate to be the beneficiaries of their expertise and to work with them on this series of programs. 20 years ago, Congress stipulated that general standards of decency be met by grantees of the National Endowment for the Arts. This is the condition that has become known as the Decency Clause. Over the next few weeks, a number of programs will be rolled out at different venues and uh, locations in the city and beyond, all around the legacy of the Decency Clause. It began, in fact, as you entered, the brief video clips that were screened are excerpts of an online archive, video archive, called Power, Taboo and the Artist. The archive features brief statements by curators, artists and art administrators from around the world examining the idea of decency standards and doing so from perspectives that are not necessarily American, thus taking the discussion beyond our own borders. The archive is ongoing and growing and is posted at the websites of the National Coalition Against Censorship and the Virilis Center. Um, we have a number of other programs coming up. Um, it seems particularly fitting that tonight's panel is um, taking place here. The whole series, in fact, is launched at the New School. In 1989, Senator Jesse Helms introduced legislation to ban federal funding of obscene and indecent art. To enforce the new amendment, the NEA established a obscenity pledge, the precursor to the decency clause. The New School was one, among other organizations, that refused to sign the pledge and filed a lawsuit, New School versus Fraunmeier, um, who was the chair of the NEA at the time. The NEA eventually released the university from the ob its obligation to sign the pledge. However, we're um, delighted and for that and many other reasons, um, very uh, proud to host this panel. I'd like to thank the panelists um, for helping us understand where we come from and where we are today. I'd like to thank my colleagues at the New School, Pamela Tillis and um, Annie Shaw in particular. I'd like to acknowledge the generous support of the Cross Currents Foundation. And now, Please let me introduce my colleague Svetlana Mincheva, Director of Programs at the National Coalition Against Censorship, whose passion for and support of free speech run as deep as her knowledge is vast. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And I'd like to thank the Viralist Center for a wonderful intellectual collaboration and of course for hosting us in this wonderful space as well as I'd love to thank the panelists for being here and uh, the NCSC staff for making this event possible. Uh, I'd like to say a few words about the, uh, the occasion that brings us here because um, some of us know this, it's a memory, for some of us it's ancient history, for today's students it's really they have to study it. So as, as Karen mentioned 20 years ago, uh, the US Congress passed an amendment to, to the statute um, uh, of the National Endowment for the Arts, specifying that in giving grants, the NEA should take into account general standards of decency and respect for the diverse beliefs and values of the American public. Now, this came uh, specifically as a result around controversy uh, with Robert Maplethorpe's photographs of the, uh, of the bondage community, as well as um, Andres Serrano's notorious Piss Christ. So it's perfectly clear that for those who introduced it, the amendment was supposed to make sure that sexually outspoken and religiously controversial work would not receive the legitimacy that public funding would grant. 
it was not only about money. Uh, the decency amendment was this hardly about respect for diversity. On the contrary, it was meant to kept at the social margins work that challenged established mainstream values, uh, whether these were sexual or religious. And yet, after a long battle in the courts, in 1998, the US Supreme Court um, affirmed, upheld the amendment. In 1995, just a little bit before that, uh, as further insurance against the possibility that uh, federal money should go to pesky, controversial artists, Congress entirely eliminated NEA grants to individual visual artists. They still do not exist. Every time a new chair comes and has the NEA, there's a little bit of a conversation. Shall we bring back individual grants to artists? There's one such conversation going on today. It has not happened. We're in 2010. So even today, when the national attention in general is turned away from debates around the arts and funding, artists and arts organizations are experiencing the long-term effects of the 1990s culture wars. And this is by far not only in terms of safer NEA funding. In many cases, overt censorship has become interiorized. It has turned into self-censorship. And then, of course, local religious and political groups still attack art by claiming that it violates community standards or that uh, it goes against the rights of taxpayers to determine where their money goes. To explore these effects of the 90s culture wars, as well as alternative funding models that arts organizations have created so as to preserve creative freedom, as well as to ask how our current culture handles controversy, we have convened a series of events, and these are the two panels, the first one being today, and uh, today's panel focuses on arts, funding, and free speech, and another panel, same time, same place, uh, next Wednesday, and that, um, uh, that panel focuses on taboo and controversy. And um, it will gather several very well-known artists to, uh, to have a conversation about how the boundaries of the permissible have shifted from 20 years ago until today. We have some artists that were controversial then. We have others that are controversial now. And on the 27th of September, a Monday, uh, with our other collaborator, the School for Visual Arts. We are hosting a screening of two films that have never had distribution in the United States. One of them is Districted, a compilation of short films by um, well-known visual artists like Matthew Barney, Richard Prince, Sam Taylor Wood, all exploring the borderline between art and pornography. Uh, never screened here, it was made in 2006. Uh, and then we'll have a double bill with that of Larry Clark's uh, very controversial 2002 film, Ken Park, also never distributed in the US and probably never to be distributed in the US. It was banned in Australia outright for its sexual content. Um, and as uh, Karen mentioned, we also have an online project of video interviews with people in the art world discussing these topics. Um, so this is the context, and now I'd like to introduce uh, Bill Ivey, who will deliver an introductory talk before we launch into the panel discussion. Bill Ivey was gracious enough to fly here today from Nashville, Tennessee, where he's the founding director of the Curb Center for Art, Enterprise, and Public Policy at Vanderbilt University, an arts policy research center. Of course, Bill Ivey is a familiar name to us because he was chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, May 1998, September 2001. Uh, very interesting dates. Um, in May 1998 was just a month before the Supreme Court upheld the Decency Clause on June 25th, um, uh, 1998. And then September 2001, we remember as the month where um, the World Trade Center was attacked, but it was also the month when those attacks dis di diverted Mayor Giuliani's attention away from uh, a crusade to form a decency commission to oversee programming in city-funded spaces, uh, a very wonderfully forgotten uh, commission today. 
Bill Ivey has also been working with the current administration, serving as team leader for arts and humanities on the Barack Obama presidential transition team. That's a mouthful. And currently directing uh, the Curb Center's Washington-based multi-agency seminar on cultural issues for senior government staff. I think uh, a wonderful initiative. Ivy's latest book, Arts Inc., How Greed and Neglect Have Destroyed Our Cultural Rights, assesses the current state of the arts in America and points to a looming crisis connected to expanding copyright, an unconstrained arts industry marketplace, and a government unwilling to engage culture as a serious arena for public policy. Prior to government service, Ivy was director of the Country Music Foundation in Nashville, Tennessee. Please welcome Bill Ivy. Thank you very much, Svetlana. Uh, it's great to be here this evening to help kick off this panel discussion. And it's great to be part of a panel cohort that has such deep experience with issues uh, surrounding the engagement between art and government and free expression. Uh, as Svetlana mentioned, I became chairman of the NEA in May of 1998, just a few weeks before the Supreme Court handled, handed down its ambiguous but nearly unanimous, this is an eight to one decision on the constitutionality of the decency clause. At the time, the endowment was thoroughly lawyered up. Our, we had two full-time attorneys all the time at the agency, but it was augmented that spring by three Yale law students in anticipation that the court would either endorse congressional authority or support a free speech claim to arts funding. Uh, insiders assumed that either outcome would immediately toss the agency into some kind of a fight. Of course, the Supreme split the difference, and though many felt that the somewhat vague ruling, Congress could give instruction and agencies could interpret it as, as they wished, uh, that interpretation itself would generate uh, lawsuits and perhaps new legislation. In the 12 years since that decision, there's been a striking absence of engagement on the issue. But I believe there have been some long-term effects on NEA grant making, and I hope my ideas will help uh, stimulate conversation later and with the audience here tonight. Uh, conventional wisdom suggests that the decency clause taught arts organizations to self-censor. I think that's part of the framing for our discussion. Fearing rejection based on sexual or political content, nonprofits would only request endowment support for mainstream non-confrontational projects. And there's no doubt some truth to this. Uh, when it came to grant applications, certainly some museums, some presenting organizations, and some publishers probably chose to advance only conservative programming. I think that's perhaps still the case. But I think the period of political controversy over the content of NEA grants had a more subtle effect on the way arts organizations approach government funding. Now, two things happen simultaneously. Now, we're team T, tag teaming on slides. There, yeah, thanks. Uh, first, the NEA's budget flattened in the 1980s. At the same time as the nonprofit sector concluded a very rapid, uh, inc continued a very rapid expansion. Remember, there were about 6,500, think of this, 6,500 cultural nonprofit institutions in the U.S. in 1965, the year that Lyndon Johnson signed the endowments authorizing legislation. Today, there are well over 100,000, and that line of growth is steep and continuous. Its expenditures dwarfed by expanded giving by the private sector by growth of state and local government support, uh, by the mid-1980s, the NEA had really ceased to be the bill payer for the nonprofit community. The truth is that the truth that the cultural sector had outgrown its federal funder was only reinforced when the NEA budget was cut by nearly one-third in 1996. And in addition to grants to individual artists being eliminated, the two primary sources of really significant money for nonprofits, challenge grants and general operating support, were also cut from the agency's work. It was in the mid-1990s then that endowment staff and arts advocates began to refer to the NEA grant as a good housekeeping seal of approval. Next slide. So symbolic meaning came to substitute for economic impact. And of course, political conservatives, Republicans for the most part, had made use of NEA grants as symbols of government 
irresponsibility for years. Jesse Helms, Alphonse D'Amato, and others had figured out that you could attack the NEA and the arts with impunity, raising money and securing votes. But when it came to survival and autonomy, uh, stretched thin across a rapidly expanding nonprofit sector, NEA grants were no longer primarily about the money. In fact, if a grant application failed, projects generally happened anyway. Now I'm going to give you, next slide. Uh, here's a quick example. This is actually, I didn't know this before I put this talk together, but this is a, an example that's actually covered in the brochure for tonight's, uh, tonight's panel. Washington, D.C., March 9th, 1999. The day of a giant snowstorm that closed down the federal government. I'm then the NEA chairman. That day across town in a large conference room at the Library of Congress, hosting a meeting, somewhat ironically, of book publishers. Just after lunch, the endowment's communications director, Sherry Simon, pulls me out of the room. I've just had a call from a New York Times stringer in Mexico City asking if the NEA has provided grant support for the publication of the English translation of a children's book called La Historia de los Colores, Story of Colors. She's been contacted by her international editor in New York, who has a copy of the book and wants a call back to interview me about this in two hours. The director of the literature program is with us, Cliff Becker, and he calls back to the office and quickly gets the file pulled. Yes, a grant for $15,000 to the Cinco Puntos Press that's channeled through a nonprofit intermediary has been approved by the review panel and by the National Council on the Arts. The funding is for two translations. Another book, one is La Historia. A staffer looks at the Spanish language original of the book. Next slide. You saw the front cover. This is the next. Another slide. Beautiful images. Another slide. Maybe the suggestion, the slight suggestion in some of sexual content. Next slide. Very suggestive. Uh, next slide. So what's the problem? Why is a Times reporter in Mexico steered to us by the International Editor of New York asking for an interview about this small, apparently innocuous $7,500 NEA grant? Now, Sherry is a master of behind the scenes back and forth with the press. So the skill set she honed during the culture wars of the early 1990s. So she gets the reporter on the phone and teases out the backstory. The backstory is this. Did the endowment know that the original book was written by Subcomandante Marcos of the Chiapas-based Zapatista movement? There it is, small print on the front cover. Subcomandante Insurgente Marcos. That's the sample that was submitted with the grant application for the translation. And, lo and behold, the President, Bill Clinton, was heading to Mexico the very next week for a state visit. The grant had been approved, the panel had recommended it, the National Council had approved it, and I had signed off on it. But, next slide. Oh, just, just, so you can keep on the back. The, the, go, go back one, please. Yeah. Uh, the, the check had not yet been sent to the press. I canceled it. Now, NEA legislation prohibits payments directly to non-U.S. entities. That constraint provided a thin but legitimate reason to stop the check. Because as chairman, I could reasonably expect that part of that $7,500, that part that funded the book, would be conveyed to the Writers Collaborative in Mexico City that had published the original volume. It was a thin but legitimate excuse. I conveyed my decision to Cinco Puntos in a lively phone conversation with the press co-owner, Bobby Bird. You can imagine how lively it was. I disappointed the Times Mexico City stringer by calling her back at the time appointed for our interview to say that there's really nothing to talk about because the grant had been canceled. Next slide. A story did run in the Times, not by the writer who phoned, but by Irv Malotsky, a very capable writer who sometimes had covered the NEA. You'll have to trust me. It's a little hard to read. And well, it's easier than I would have thought, actually, but I'll, I'll give you just a few highlights from the piece. The headline, of course, Foundation Will Bankroll Rebel, Rebel Chief's Book NEA Dropped. And that's true. The Lannan Foundation, uh, within days, gave $15,000 to Cinco Puntos Press, doubling the amount that I had withheld. A quote, Mr. Ivey said he was worried that some of the money might find its way to the Zapatista guerrillas. That's true. That's what I said. 
Another quote, in 1989, the Lannan Foundation gave $35,000 to the Washington Project for the Arts so that it could exhibit the homoerotic photographs of Robert Maplethorpe. Another point in the, from the book, the book has nothing to do with the Zapatista Rebellion. It is a folk tale about Mexican gods who took a gray world and filled it with brilliant color. And there's a quote from a panelist who said he understands the decision, a quote, of course, from a Republican member of Congress who says I'd done exactly the right thing. Cinco Puntos had, and this is also in the story, had received many inquiries about La Historia and had decided to ship 5,000 copies immediately, well in advance of the scheduled May publication date. And of course, there was a bit more. Let's see the next slide. No one had seen, no one at the endowment had seen the English translation. And it was fascinating that it had already come out before the grant money had been conveyed, but we finally secured a copy. It's still the same handsome, slender children's book. Now here's, this is the original, and this is the English version. Still handsome, still the same photographs. Next slide, please. But now it carries quite literally, next slide, a political, next one, go right on, a political overlay. In addition to Subcomandante Marcos' author credit, much more prominently displayed on the new dust jacket, on the inside, you see uh, a photograph of him in full uh, guerrilla regalia. Uh, and then on the back, next slide, inside flap, a story about the uh, history of the origins of the Zapatista Rebellion. And on the back, which actually I didn't bring here, I didn't uh, scan that, that one, but I can read to you a quotation from Amy Ray of the Indigo Girls, who says, the, as citizens of the United States, our apathy, overconsumption, and lack of moral political conviction has created situations all over the world similar to one in Chiapas. So what had happened was, uh, next slide, one more please, and one more. Yeah, a few things to consider. First, these are very nuanced decisions. I'm not being critical of Bobby and Lee Boyd or their colleagues at the press, far from it. They simply figured out that the way to derive maximum benefit from an NEA grant was to engage the symbolic meaning of endowment support, even if it meant putting some of the financial benefit at risk. And second, this choice was enabled in part by the truth that in 1999, the average NEA grant was smaller than it had been a decade earlier. Grants were really less essential. After all, the book was in fact published before any grant money was received. Third, the strategy succeeded. The book was actually number one, the number one children's book on the fledgling Amazon.com for several days. And it achieved that success, though at the expense of the agency. Uh, the NEA tends to think of itself as one of the contending teams on the field of cultural conflict, but it's usually the ball. So far from promulgating caution, I think the toxic atmosphere of the 1990s Encourage applicants to consider controversial projects as a possibility to engage the endowment in a way that would allow the applicant to perhaps ride the wave of, a wave of publicity. The controversies of the 1990s ended up, in a sense, corrupting everybody. First, congressional services, conservatives and the Christian right, but later, to a certain extent, arts organizations themselves. And as we think today about our situation today, this style of doing government work, the cynical manipulation of symbols to achieve press attention and political goals has become standard operating procedure in Washington today. 20 years ago, it was just about the NEA, the arts, perhaps the gay and lesbian community as they connected with the arts. Today, it covers a multitude of issues. It's a style of doing government. As I say, the agency thought of itself as a player when it was really the ball, with blo both sides playing rough caution, perhaps appropriately, became a guiding principle of NEA management. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now have the great pleasure of introducing our moderator, uh, Laura Flanders, who will then introduce the panelists individually. Laura Flanders gets it. Um, that was the verdict I first came across long ago and have never found it not to be completely accurate. A television host, blogger, journalist, film producer and writer, Flanders has been an essential progressive voice in this country. 
Radio has been one of her many media platforms. She joined Radio Air America in 2004, just as it began, but had already hosted for many years the award-winning Your Call um, on public radio in San Francisco. For more than 10 years, she had also produced and hosted Counterspin, a nationally syndicated radio program of the media watch group FAIR, and these days she is host of Radio Nation, the nationally syndicated weekly radio program of The Nation magazine. On television, Laura Flanders is the host of Grid TV, the daily news discussion and take action program seen on Free Speech TV. Um, she has appeared on many other television shows, including Lou Dobbs Tonight, Larry King Live, um, the O'Reilly Factor, The Washington Journal, Donahue, Good Morning America, etc. Um, Flanders also writes blogs, articles, entire books. Among the books, let me just briefly point out two of them to you. Blue Grit was one that was published in 2007. Blue Grit, um, the true, true Democrats take back politics from the politicians which was an investigation into what people at the grassroots know about that the Democratic Party leaders do not learn, uh, do not know, could learn. And another book um, is entitled Bush Women, Tales of a Cynical Species that was published in 2004 and was an expose on women in George W. Bush's cabinet. Let me um, welcome Laura. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming out. Um, I'm excited. Um, you know, in independent media, we've gone along a very similar kind of trajectory to some of the artists here on the panel. I feel as if, you know, I work, I've been working forever to figure out how can we keep doing our work regardless. And I think that's kind of the approach of the artists in our midst and in our society. Um, 20 years, boy. Um, 20 years, I want to thank Karen and Svetlana, but Svetlana, you talked about, you know, the boundaries of the permissible changing. And I think, you know, in 20 years, we've seen the boundaries of permissible character assassination and baiting changing. You know, it used to be just the artists and the queers. Um, now it's the president, you know? Uh, I don't know whether to laugh or cry. Um, you know, I think it is true. First they came for the artists and then they come for the rest of us. And I think that's why this conversation is so important. We've got some fantastic panelists and we'll talk for a little while amongst our, our group up here and then we'll throw it open to the audience and have some conversation with you. Um, we'll vote on whether Bill did the right thing. No, we won't. Um, <laughs> we'll vote on whether the 1990s culture wars corrupted everybody, yeah? We'll ask you to prove it. Um, and then we'll uh, talk about how regardless we continue uh, to make art that raises the important questions of these times because, for heaven's sake, journalists aren't doing it. Um, well, some of them are. Uh, Becca Economopoulos is an extraordinary uh, multifaceted person that I know from her work with Grit TV. She is, among other things, a grassroots field and online organizer as well as the co-founder and director of Not an Alternative, a volunteer-run nonprofit organization based in Brooklyn. Um, they curate and produce work, but more than that, they get involved in the challenges and the struggles of the day. And they are also creating a kind of society, an alternative model based on shared workspace and resources. And she's talked on Grit TV about that. Um, Magda Sawan is co-owner and co-director of Postmasters Gallery in New York City. She's organized close to, close to 200 exhibitions, um, shown young artists, established artists, all media, and shown them in a uh, context of painting, sculpture, photography, uh, she'll talk more about the kind of commercial world and some of the artists that she's uh, shown has some extraordinary exhibitions uh, originating in her gallery and touring. Nato Thompson's a curator at the New York-based public arts institution Creative Time. It, does Creative Time take credit for those beautiful lights that go up uh, uh, September 11th? The first iteration. All right, I give you credit every year. So okay. for nine years, I've been looking at those lights that go up where the trade towers used to be and thinking, yay, Creative Time. Um, they commission and uh, produce and present all sorts of art um, with the belief that artists' interventions promote the democratic use, not just of our brains, but of public space um, prior to creative time 
Nato worked at Mass Mocha as a curator. So he's been on both sides of all of this. Martha Wilson, founding director of Franklin Furness, is with us in her own persona, not in the persona of Tipa Gore today. Um, but I remember her in the persona of Tipa Gore during the culture wars. Um, she's also performed as Alexander Haig, Nancy Reagan, Barbara Bush, some of the Bush women. Um, I'm glad you're here as yourself. And uh, I hope that we get to hear more about the role of Franklin Furness, which started in 1976 and gone, has gone through many, many iterations um, since. Let's start with this question of have the culture wars corrupted or even affected everybody? Um, and Becca, I think I'll throw that first to you. Do you feel like these struggles that we've been talking about, Maplethorpe, the NEA4, the name Jesse Helms, does it put the hairs up on the back of your neck or no? <laughs> Who? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, no, actually, I did uh, quip earlier that I was uh, in a cab on the way here, and I called NATO, and I was like, NATO, what's the decency clause? Um, so, uh, I, you know, I think that, of course, it's still relevant, but it's uh, relevant in a way in which its uh, impacts have trickled down and sort of permeated at the very local level and throughout the entire nonprofit and art funding structure. Um, but also I think that we're in a completely different climate, uh, media and cultural climate than we were during the uh, days of the beginning of the decency clause. Now there are hundreds and thousands of cable and uh, you know satellite television stations. The internet has exploded, multimedia and video gaming, etc. So I, you know I our perspective is not an alternative on art is that art and culture absolutely are the sort of Brechtian hammer with which to shape the world. Um, and, uh, and I think that when the decency clause was first introduced, it's not especially re revelatory, for me, revelatory for me to suggest that um, the right really recognized it as a political weapon understanding that culture and art was being used as a political weapon. Um, and, and this isn't new, Graham. She said in the 20s that uh, cultural hegemony is where power from where power derives, right? And so I think that we're in a completely different place now understanding that uh, we are not fighting the institution, right? It is not a monolithic thing. Power does not derive from above in the uh, social media, contemporary culture landscape, it acts uh, of us and through us. Mm. And so as a result, I think that um, what is political art or what is um, threatening is a very different thing. Art is embraced by the mainstream, by the right and the left, and by institutions of power. I mean, it's the Richard Florida argument, the best way to invest in and develop a, a city is to invest in the creative class. It's the information economy now. So it's not an attempt to strangle um, art, by all means fuel it. In fact, controversy means more hits online, um, means more revenue. So we're operating in a really different place and, and our interest um, as an alternative arts organization, well, one thing, we're not necessarily married or even remotely interested in being alternative. We'd like to see um, more spaces like ours, and yeah, we'd love a, a, a lot more funding. Um, but then also, we you know, have had to uh, evolve a, a model that gives us a much more diverse revenue stream um, because we are interested in threatening art. <laughs> we are interested in something that does, you know, that does function as a hammer to shape the world, rather than just feeding into the the saturation of, of a really high static to noise ratio of culture. All right, we'll come back for more. Um, Martha, what's what's your perspective on this uh, in terms of the, the way the culture wars continue to affect you or did affect you? The well, you know? uh, I'm in my own little rocking boat, so. It, um, it has been for me a very conscious decision to run a gallery as a commercial gallery. I do it for 26 years. I come from a communist country and that perhaps affected the, the choice because I wasn't, um, um, I, I wasn't very hopeful that uh, what, I had, uh, what I would have in mind or what I would want to follow would be an easy material to be supported through, um, through 
government grants, my trust in government was rather limited. And, um, and it affords enormous amount of freedom and uh, responsibility and in the way you just search for funding through different ways. My desire was to look for artists that always um, uh, are kind of at the creative edge, always try to push the envelope. So in many instances, it was not, not even a way to approach um, any any official funding because we show a lot of new media work that me, that work is very undefined legally there's no way to go past uh, past the uh, kind of legal brackets of public organizations to be funded plus you know there's this great divide between commerce and commercial gallery and and the public um run institutions and my desire was always to to close it to in a sense that uh, the artists we show uh, are not uh, uh, a lot of them are not commercially defined so there's there and, and I would like to continue doing that with bridging Mm. those gaps and, and perhaps changing the canon of what's defined as commercial and have succeeded in many, many instances. That right. I have lots of questions mm. for you already. Mm -hmm. but let me move on from, from Magda to, to Martha. What about you? How did this all touch you? Uh, censorship is alive and well. I'm going to show you what I mean. My mother brought me up on sales, never buy anything full price. And this raw here, Filene's basement in Boston, it's crazy down there, really drives you bananas, but if you put a little energy in it, you'll save a few bucks. Three pairs for 99 cents. You know, you can't go wrong. I pay twenty dollars for it, so you can imagine what it lists for. Probably like you know, forty dollars. You know, it's very, very nice material here. <laughs> this uh, video was made in 1973 by Susan Mogul. It was posted on YouTube a year ago. Then it was taken down by YouTube. Then the National Coalition Against Censorship intervened and has put it back. So you can watch this now on YouTube, the, 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 the difficulty was that YouTube had a policy. Uh, YouTube is not for pornography or sexually explicit content. So we can talk about what that means because there's now a new policy that allows for artistic nudity. <laughs> okay, I'll, now I wanna show you another, another slide. Uh, this is Karen Finley in 1989. Um, She's doing her performance, Constant State of Desire. She was branded the chocolate-smeared young woman by conservative newspaper columnist Evans and Novak. This is because she smeared her naked breasts with chocolate frosting and then sprinkled bean sprouts and then glitter. But I think what really made this performance uh, a, a touchstone for the the culture wars was that she's wearing Wool Woolworth's cotton underpants and uh, tube socks and loafers, which are uh, items of clothing which resist the sexual gaze. They sure do. This is um, a collaboration by Joshua Kinberg and Yuri Gitman. It's called Bikes Against Bush. It happened in 2004. Uh, Bikes Against Bush is a mobile hotspot. The, this, these um, canisters that he's putting on the back of the bike spray chalk onto the pavement. Uh, you, you send a text message to the um, handlebars, to the, the cell phone on the handlebars, and then it translates that text into uh, a, an image on the sidewalk. Uh, so Yuri Gitman and um, Joshua Kinberg were planning to do the performance, Bikes Against Bush, right before the Republican National Convention. And they were uh, 
prophylactically arrested and the bike was impounded and put in the back of a van and then lost by the police department, the New York City Police Department. Uh, then he had to fight a lawsuit, it cost him about $30,000, and he... Uh, I think that... Okay, so um, in briefly, in the, in the wake of the culture wars, I took my organization into virtual space thinking that the freedom of expression that we had enjoyed in the loft in the 70s was no longer possible, but perhaps the internet provided a free zone, maybe not forever, maybe not in every possible dimension, but for now, this was, decision was made uh, on our 20th anniversary, 1996, 1997. We sold the loft, went into the virtual realm, and now we've been there for a decade. Mm. Coming to you, NATO, we'll pick up on all these threads, but looking back, does it feel like ancient history to you? Well, it's interesting. Uh, yeah, kind of. In a sense, you know, things have changed. The art universe has become incre uh, incredibly privatized and non-profitized with their own versions of kind of censorship that in, uh, happens for different reasons. I mean, it's certainly not unusual in the commercial art market to see sex issues all over the place, right? I mean, you know, when, I mean, like, it's so funny. You got, porn is very popular, right? It's like, someone did this project in Florida where they were talking about community standards and they said, you know, if you measured the actual hits on websites and then assessed community standards based on that, porn would actually be the central value system. Um, so, you know, it's interesting in that regard, but, in, you know, what's happened, of course, is that in the nonprofit sector, you know, while um, certain kind of issues are taboo, what's really happened is there's a different kind of censorship at work, of course, right, which is the censorship based on aesthetic dispositions of the ruling class. Mm -hmm. And that battle is very much at large in America. You look at Western Europe, I mean, most of, most of the world's arts institutions actually function as civic spaces for valuable political thought. Whereas in the United States, you know, unlike, well, this place is related to academia where it still occurs, but predominantly in the nonprofit institutions, they are vacuous when it comes to political thought because they reflect the ruling class values of our, our era. So this is the kind of situation we're in. We have a kind of void of civic participation in the nonprofit sector, and that is a major disaster. Also, I'd say, Beck is totally right. Culture is politics at this point. It is the weapon. And, you know, as far as, you know, I could, we could blame the right, we can blame government, we can blame all kinds of people, but the one person I want to, you know, where is the space to actually produce civic uh, action is I wish the left-leaning community would get as onto that tip as the right, right? Because I look at a lot of the kind of progressive magazines and they still have an art section that reflects bourgeois ruling class aesthetic values. And it's usually way at the back. And it's way at the back. And they don't even understand that artists, activists that get this are producing a kind of politics that can push the agenda forward. And that's where my frustrations are at its largest, is not, and yeah, I guess with Grit TV, you know, you're doing that. I mean, like, there's good stuff, but it's really weak. Karl Rove is just like, you know, I always think of him as the great American curator now. You know, he gets culture, he loves yeah. culture. You know, and I think that's where we're at. Is the I hope right you're saying the whole, the left is weak, not just Grit TV. What? I hope you're saying the left is weak, not Grit TV. That's what I'm saying. Well, All I'm right, saying good. Just, but, well, no, no, but Laura, I'm just saying like you're using yeah. culture. No, but I will say that with respect to funding, in there is no place where the two meet. Right. I not only host the show, I do the fundraising. So I know just how rare it is to find any support for a daily multi-issue news leading program that also includes culture. And I think you're, you, you're absolutely right. Um, my beloved partner, Elizabeth Strebs, in the audience, I drag her on the nation cruise once in a while, <laughs> and she just sits there like this. <laughs> what is it you guys don't get yeah, about well. how societies change? And that leads us to something I wanted to ask you, Bill. Um, you know, I wasn't entirely joking about, you know, first it was the artist, now it's the president. Mm -hmm. um, 
how do you see the relationship between the kind of culture wars that you witnessed and in some ways were part of and you know, the other baiting wars that we're in now, in very, very uh, dire straits with? Well, I think NATO, I think others have alluded to this. Uh, to me, uh, you know, the past is prelude. The culture wars uh, grounded in uh, fear of art and artists look small time compared to the, to the current environment in which every small issue is politicized and cultural, culture or cultural-like difference is, uh, is placed in the foreground of, of controversy. I, I think it truly makes the, uh, it, it makes the decency clause seem quaint. Uh, it, it, you know, to talk about general standards of decency and respect for diverse beliefs and values could almost be a, fl a banner behind which you could go forward and create some positive reforms if you could take the words literally and talk about diverse beliefs and values. And I think that's one of the reasons that the, that it do that the phrase doesn't get invoked. It would be, uh, it's unimaginable, and, and I'll, those younger than I can imagine better than I can how, how these how the culture wars would have played out mm. in the current environment of not of post broadcast media mm. uh, with with uh, you know daily polling daily commentary and and uh, bloggers across the spectrum ready to seize on any issue and advance it without much thought or further investigation in the most contentious way possible uh, I, I think the the caution that not only the NEA but federal, all federal agencies have exhibited over the last decade springs in part from the, the, the change in the environment that, uh, that has taken the spirit of the, the, most, the most damaging, undemocratic, and undermining aspects of the culture wars and spread that style across the larger political discourse, uh, I, I think much to the, to the, to the detriment of, of our society. Yeah. Becca, I'd love you to respond um, to what Martha said. You, maybe I'm simplifying, but my impression was you were saying, you know, a censorship hit can, re can produce more hits, that um, celebrity can be a path to success online, that the online opportunity substitutes for um, NEA-funded opportunity. Martha didn't sound like she was telling that same story. Well, I think if your you know, video gets yanked from YouTube, um, then it's hard to get hits, but there's a uh, the good likelihood that then you'll get a media story or bloggers will pick that up and you know, it, it'll reach an audience. Yeah, I do think that um, uh, NATO mentioned privatization. I think culture has been privatized. We're no longer getting government funding for arts and culture, but it's coming from Madison Avenue advertising and from, you know, the, the corporate world through, you know, online social media uh, production of culture. Um, so we have a very robust cultural climate right now, um, but we've sort of... Uh, um, I, mean, I really like what you said, take the phrase literally, um, diverse beliefs and values, because ultimately I feel like the, the, um, the, the difference between the left's use of art and culture and the rights right now, the left largely has been using art as, um, uh, as graphic design. <laughs> you know, and, um, and it, it was interesting that it was actually the um, UFC sergeant who then landed at the NEA that commissioned the Shepard Ferry poster for Obama ultimately got uh, thrown under a bus because the Obama administration was interested in engaging the arts and cultural community around civic participation. Man, they're so careful about the language. Does everybody know this story, UFC sergeant's story? I'm seeing heads nodding, but... Um who wants to tell the story? Becca, you more or less told it, but I, I, uh, I, I, Bill? Yossi was uh, active in the campaign, uh, worked on the famous Obama, Obama poster with Shepard Ferry, kind of publicist, almost manager type. The Hulk young, one. Young, energetic guy, very, very hip to new media, uh, was brought into the administration out of the campaign early on and made communi appointed communications director of the NEA, which is a political appointment. And very shortly after he got on the job, he had 
many ideas, uh, but one was to get a large conference call of artists and arts organizations organized and, and talk to that cohort about uh, helping to advance the vision of the Obama administration. Now, carrying forward his enthusiasm from the campaign, I would say he spoke on that conference call in language that could be recast or, or edited into snippets that would make it sound as though he were ad advocating the politicization of, uh, of, of, of the government's relationship with these arts organizations. You know, if you, if you want to get a grant, you have to help with the Obama. You know, nothing like that was said, but a conservative blogger who was on the call uh, did just that. And, uh, and the Obama administration being, uh, coming out of the ca campaign and the transition being extraordinarily gun shy, I think more so than it, much more than it needed to be, uh, very quickly uh, cut him loose. Is that a fair? Yeah. Ca yeah. Well, there was a little, uh, ca not so cameo role played by Glenn Beck. So, well, and this, was, this and followed very closely to, on the Van Jones uh, story. And this is the point I wanted to make is that, so, you know, this was a use of graphic design and street art uh, that uh, for, for the political campaign, uh, Yossi gets thrown under the bus. But then you see Glenn Beck and at the, uh, uh, what was the name of the rally restoring that just happened? Honor. The Restoring Honor Rally. Like, I got, I was, I went to it. That's so um, awesome. I was shooting video, and I was um, really confused that so many folks were walking around with what looked like the Shepherd Fairy poster. I was like, are they wearing Obama T-shirts? But no, it's the uh, Courage. Faith, on, faith, faith, hope, charity. charity. You don't watch faith, Glenn hope, Beck's charity. show. I, he has it right behind him in it. his studio. Um, Shepherd Fairy ripoffs. This is smart to me. This is really, really smart. Right? Is that in this current climate um, of a saturation of symbols um, everywhere, rather than throwing up your hands because you can't get funding from the NEA or the uh, nonprofit funding structure, and deciding that political art means small, alternative. Uh, do it yourself, et cetera. You know, why aren't we doing what Glenn Beck is doing, which is taking a look at what is organic and viral within the culture and seeking to destabilize those symbols, mm -hmm. brands, events, and history, right? To um, point them in a direction of meaning. Like this is the, the critical form of engagement that is relevant in the contemporary landscape now. Well, aren't we, NATO, are we or aren't we? Not enough. Are we? Well, frankly, I think we, there's a lot of movement that direction. I would not uh, throw up our hands and say all is lost by any stretch of the imagination, but there's certainly steps that could be made um, on a bunch of structural levels. I, you know, like I said, I think progressive institutions, particularly in the kind of Democratic Party and the kind of left NGO world that are like still, you know, waxing nostalgic for 68, you know, that... Ugh. Like that has got to stop, and like people have got to like Becca says, just kind of embrace these kind of destabilizing kind of viral methodologies, as well as I think with the you know, the Yossi Sargent moment was I think a very unsavvy moment for the Obama administration early on because it was a real opportunity to define a kind of identity just as much as Glenn Beck is defining an identity culturally, and I think like giving that up. It just sets up a domino effect of giving up, giving up. I think it's a tough battle, but it, it is a cultural battle out there. And I, I would also say to young artists in the audience, you know, for us in the New York, you know, if you go around the galleries and you feel like that's art, that ain't art. I mean, that's part of the art thing, but that's not all of it. That's not all of it. I think the stuff that we really enjoy can't find a home in a way. Magda does a great job, but she no, by no means represents a majority of those out there. <laughs> She's an alternative, very commercial space, which is great. But generally, it's just, we're all kind of orphans out there trying to find a place to produce meaning together. Bill, it does, one question about government before we move on into the world of commerce. I mean, was there ever a moment in the, in the Obama administration to follow up on what NATO said, where they said, well, there was FDR, there was the WPA, how about funding above board, blast it to the headlines. We are gonna fund artists to bring this country around, gate, create jobs. No, no, oh, okay. and hell no. Just but <laughs> let, 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 let me let me mention a couple very very quickly. Uh, I, I think that uh, the problem that that Yossi Sergeant ran into was partly because on a on a 
nonpartisan basis from administration to administration. The arts and culture have only been dealt with as an amenity. Yeah. They're very easy to cut loose. Everybody loves them. Everybody has nice White House events. But when push comes to shove, it's never a policy priority. And I think a number of the panelists have already uh, 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 have, have alluded to that. In the Obama, you know, the, the, the stimulus bill was put together in the Obama transition. It was not really Nancy Pelosi's bill. And all of us working in the transition competed to try to get our agencies in that stimulus bill. Mm -hmm. And I went to John Podesta, who was co-director of the transition, and asked for $500 million for the NEA, the NEH, and the IMLS, for those three cultural grant-making agencies. And he said, no, I don't want the NEA's name in the bill because it will be controversial and it will be attacked by Republicans, it will be a wedge issue, and it will affect the whole bill. I then went to Peter Orzag, who was handling the budget issues within the transition, and pleaded. I said to Peter, after a pitch, if I leave this transition as one of the only Senate-confirmed agency heads in the transition, there's nothing for my agencies. I'll be humiliated. And at the 11th hour, I think the last day of the transition, there was suddenly $50 million for the NEA. Yeah. Uh, John was right. One second it was attacked. It was attacked. It all, and, and it, it managed to survive, which was a real difference from what would have happened perhaps a decade or, or two ago. But uh, it was not supported, and uh, for good reason. I mean, John understood that this would be politicized and it would be a problem for the bill, and, uh, and, and in fact it was. The NEA then did the best job, the quickest job, of moving money out, but the Office of Management and Budget and the administration didn't want to make headlines around that because they didn't want the stimulus, the recovery bill, to lead with the arts. Yeah. So there are huge issues. Mm -hmm. And this is true of the administration I worked in. It's true of Republican administrations. It's not, it's not a characteristic unique to this uh, administration. Mm. It's across Magda, the would you go as far as to say that it's good not to have government funding? You don't want it. It corrupts, it controls, it brings ties. Um, I honestly have no opinion because um, <laughs> I, I never really um, attempted to get any. Right now I have a... Um, a situation in which uh, funding for my exhibition was refused by American Embassy in Poland because um, st it's, um, it's a political material that um, then I refused to take out of the exhibition. So we effectively looking for other funding. It was just partial. Uh, but. Um, You know, in a, in a perfect world, of course, it would be. But the reality is that uh, I'm, I'm just too old and wise to ask for it, because it, it, it would be a wasted effort for a lot of projects, not only to, uh, to go over a threshold threshold of a commercially run space, which, uh, you know, I don't think it's a, it's a um, horror story to be to be established in that manner it's just one searches for financing your operation through means other than uh, uh, grant and public institutional support Martha did you want to come in on this before the panel Bill Ivy and I were talking about how difficult it was to raise money for Karen Finley to smear chocolate frosting on her breasts in the 80s and how much easier it is for Franklin Furness to raise money to preserve the slide of Karen <laughs> Finley smearing chocolate frosting on her breasts because it is understood that this is history and it's important history and it may be um, if you, even if you don't agree with it, you can understand the value of preserving history. So if Becca did it today, she'd be in trouble. That's right. But if 20 years from now we're trying to sell the slide of Becca That's doing right. it today, yeah. we'll be all right. <laughs> Let's talk a bit about commerce. Um, 1996, it just stuck in my mind, was the year you said the NEA got a third budget cut, a third of its budget yes. cut. It was the same year as the um, Telecommunications Act uh, was passed, growing the power of telecommunications corporations and their influence in our culture. Um, 
NATO? Who wants to weigh in on, is there a connection there? And, and how is it to try to work in this uh, commercial sphere? Magda's talked a little bit about the art world, but uh, in the world of, of, of broadcasting, of uh, internet, working with Google, anybody want to talk about that, NATO? Um, I mean, do these corporations have more power in determining our culture now than the government Absolutely. Ever did? I mean, I think the most... That's, I think, uh, I was just thinking about the fact that, um, you know, the culture industries have such a grip on the national psyche. That's why culture has such a weapon. It's got so many sources at its disposal to get, and, and through power, you know, of course, it circulates via power. You know, I think Noam Chomsky was the one that said, you know, of course, all information's out there. You know, everybody can go to a library and get any book. It's just people get, tend to go to certain places and get the same books. And it's kind of even distributive media still, people are getting the same sources. And I think like the privatization of media has become, you know, it's very interesting because I think Rebecca has a very good point. It's funny to talk about government because frankly, it feels like under, you know, privatization has worked such that it just feels like government's to some degree an accepted lapdog of privatization at this point. That, you know, the battle isn't with government anymore. I think, like, because we already know that the battle's already circulated through the kind of conditions of capital through the various information technologies and energy technologies that are out there. So how do you confront that is the real question mm -hmm. when they're financing the whole game. Yeah. I mean, that's the riddle, right? That's where we're at. Well, how do you? I uh, think you have to locate where power is and you have to get a little you have to get old school, you know, you got to think about, I thought the all globalization movement was a phenomenal moment in our historical period where an analysis of capitalism's relationship to space and culture wasn't just a national question, but a global question that, you know, people realize that the plight that they're experiencing here applies to people in Korea, applies to people in South America. And that was a really important moment. And then it had, you know, it's interesting to talk about the Zapatistas because, of course, the Zapatista movement was the one that was credited with a very profound postmodern analysis of global postmodern capitalism that we are now struggling with. Becca? Um, well, a big question on my mind these days is how do you uh, participate in the middle of a participation paradigm? Like, how can you critically participate? What does activism look like um, when any form of resistance or art or culture, anything that can be represented is subsumed and commodified? or monetized in some way. Ultimately, if you feel like uh, there's a fundamental problem with an economic system that's based on an ideology of unlimited growth in a finite system, um, which IE is a euphemism, by the way, if you didn't catch it, a critique of capitalism, right? How do you produce work um, that's relevant within that context? Uh, I mean, to me, it's not the production of alternative forms. The second you do, they're, you know, they're out there. Um, so you look at existing forms, and there's artists who are doing really interesting work speaking in the name of the institution, using the vocabulary of what's out there, like Jonathan Hawk, um, who you know has this great piece up right now. There's probably no funding uh, that he got for it, but it's. Uh, um, where a lot of day laborers go to get jobs picked up off the highway by the Home Depot in Brooklyn. And there's a lot of uh, metal signs bolted into the wall there. And he has one that really looks like it was created by the federal government. Uh, he made up his own uh, iconography of like this eagle and crazy font and a lot of text. And it says that basically you had the mandatum, mand minimum wage, you know, is enforced at 11 some, something an hour and blah, 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 all this legalese. Guess what? It's not $11. <laughs> it's not 11 something an hour. Um, it, so it, I really love that, like using the vocabulary of the institution. Christopher Robbins does this as well with his piece WPA 2010, mm -hmm. where he's actually getting funding through Kickstarter and other means, um, creating a storefront where right across the street is a parole agency. So convicts are coming straight out of jail to get to visit their parole officer and going across the street to his help wanted sign, um, where he is then you know, canvassing the neighborhood and asking folks, what can we do? 
you know, what, what do we need? Filling potholes to installing park benches to all these things, and he puts folks to work. Mm -hmm. Acting in the name of the government. There's not an irony or a wink and a nod in this kind of, you know, which I think is the art and culture of the 90s. Mm -hmm. We need to get smarter, mm -hmm. right? And we need to be really serious and stop, uh, you know, rejecting the institution as this monolithic source of power and understanding that power is uh, invisible, insidious, and it's in every, in every one of us now in this day and age. Well, I, I love to hear uh, examples of art that you think are doing the destabilizing oh, sure. work today. Um, Martha, NATO, well, Magda, I, Martha. I want to go back to the beginning of the culture wars. Um, I was on a, a march. Well, this is not a happy story. I was on a, a march for uh, reproductive rights. We um, Planned Parenthood leased an entire train. We all went down to Washington, and our plan was to throw yellow tennis balls through the um, gate, the gate that surrounds the White House, onto the lawn, writing our messages on the lawn. We get there. We get to Union Station. We walk out the door, and overnight, the religious right had planted tiny little crosses in a perfect grid all over the mall. Mm -hmm. And I thought, we've lost. More effective. NATO. Uh, there's, um, I think one of the kind of interesting things that's currently been happening is uh, there's artists that are producing alternative infrastructures as a way of thinking it past like just gestures as a way of working. And uh, I could be very more clear about that. Um, there's a group called uh, Stu out of, out of Baltimore that's kind of been borrowing this model that's been circulating, particularly in the United States, of these alternative dinners where people pay like 20 bucks to get in. A food, food is locally sourced through local farmers. People basically, the money that's aggregated is then given in this Baltimore version. There's one in New York called Feast. There's one in Chicago called Incubate. There's one in Portland, Oregon called Soup. Um, my <laughs> girlfriend started one in Philadelphia called Philly Steak. Um, but nonetheless, the money that's aggregated then people get, goes to um, everyone gets to vote on proposals that are at the door. To in particular in Baltimore, it's more towards community development projects that move across a lot of race and class lines. And everybody looks at them, and then the people that are presenting these proposals actually present their ideas at the dinner. And everyone votes, and whoever gets the most votes gets the bag of cash at the end. <laughs> but the goal, of course, is a alternative funding because, of course, it's its own money. But the other part is to produce a kind of confluence of food, economy, and culture that has its own community to thank for all of that. And how's the art at the end of it, quality-wise? It's up to the community. You know, it's up to the people in the room, which is very nice. And they're very different because um, the ones in New York City, for example, Feast, those are very community-based kind of arty stuff. Baltimore is straight-up activist stuff yeah. across, and much more communities of color like that. And then the one in Portland, Oregon, as you might imagine, is a little more hippie. And, you know, it reflects the kind of the communities that they're working through. But it's interesting. But let me ask a question. Or, do you want to speak to that? No, no. Um, I mean, the question I have is like, so we keep hearing these excuses to explain where we're at, right? Sorry, it's the financial crisis, and thus all arts and academic and cultural institutions have their budgets slashed. Um, and so in response, we have these micro uh, funding programs like Yay for Kickstarter and Yay for Stu. Um, and these are excellent things. I'm really grateful that they're out there, but in the meantime, how are we shifting the climate, right? What, what is the pressure to, because I don't want it I work full time, so do my partners, right? We are funding our work and our space, and it's a labor of love, and we don't really sleep. And, um, you know, and, and it's, it, it, I, I look at our European friends or friends in other, you know, places where there is public funding for big community centers that really are like a vibrant incubators for ideas and, uh, contributions to culture and society. I mean, there's, I, when I compare and I look at what we're doing, I'm like, oh, man, we're just going, doing this little small thing and celebrating it. I, I, I don't think that's the best way but to But I go. don't agree with that, Becca, because like, I frankly, I mean, I, I see the frustration, but I think one of the things is I think there's a real, because I know you want to be like, let's get out in the streets and take on the big structures, right? That's what you want. 
Not necessarily. No. no, but I mean, be, I wear a couple hats, but yeah. no, I feel like I'm not even talking about political art, right? I think yeah. we have to think beyond political, right? And to me, that's like art is about creating symbols within the landscape that shape our, our understanding and what the world looks like ultimately. Yeah, um, but I guess this is what I mean to say. That doesn't mean the globalization movement on the streets. Yeah, yeah, but what I mean to say is like, what I think is interesting or very important is the production of spaces that are not navigated by the conditions of capital, right? And I think that's what those alt models are doing, is that it's not the thing in and of itself that the gesture of these social spaces of everyone eating dinner that's important. What's important is it produces a space unmediated by, to some degree, by these kind of capitalist mm -hmm. cultural movements such that politics can produ be produced out of them over time. That's what I think is very important. That is something that like needs to be produced here in relation to a massive culture industry meltdown, right? Like it's produced subjectivities where people don't think outside of that terrain. That's what, I think it's advantageous that way. We're going to come I, back to the question I, of art I, I in like just a second. Not. I just want to um, hold that thought, Bill. I just want to remind folks, we're going to go to questions from the audience in about you know three or four minutes. So if you have a question, there you. are microphones. Oh, there's one microphone right there. You can begin, and there's one hidden, oh, right there. Um, you can begin lining up at the mic if you want. I, uh, I want to pick up on something that, you know, Becca said about the, it feels like, I think I'm interpreting you correctly and that, you know, it feels like we're just doing a lot of little things. How do we take on the big issues? And it caused me to think maybe for the first time that as, as annoying and as the culture wars were and as unhappy we were with some of the outcomes, there were truly national conversations. When, when someone, you know, when there was a piece of art where someone had to step on the American flag, when, when there were homoerotic photographs in an exhibition, I mean, these were, the, there were conversations that were highly politicized, they were ideologically driven, but they were national and they weren't commodified. Mm -hmm. And, and I, think, I think that both of those observations about, you, all, you almost get the feeling that you're punching air because if something rises to a level of visibility, some part of the very savvy uh, commercial system will suddenly co-opt it. And, 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 uh, and, and, and I think it's very hard today to get the kind of traction that the arts community had in the mm -hmm. late 80s and early 90s when it could damn well stir things up. Mm -hmm. And I, wh while I have this microphone, I do want to walk <laughs> back, since there may be a reporter who will talk about me uh, attacking the Obama administration tomorrow. So, but uh, I want to walk back my comment about yeah. no interest in the arts just a little bit, because the Obama campaign was the first one ever to really have a fairly robust list of objectives around the arts. They were fairly r conventional objectives, but they were robust. Uh, and something that is going on quietly, and I'm not really aware of how it's playing out. I know how it started. I don't know where it is, but the, the West Wing of the Obama administration is beginning to take up uh, cultural issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this is a huge step because culture has historically been situated in the First Lady's office in the East Wing of the White House. And just to move into the, na in, into the uh, Domestic Policy Council is, 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 a, is a tremendous positive step. So I don't want to be quite as negative as and I And how seen. do you think Rocco Landisman is doing this? Well, I think he's, you know, I've known Rocco for a while. I was probably the only person in the arts community, kind of, you know, New Yorkers knew him for other reasons, but I did, I, I was aware of him. And uh, it was a very, I didn't bring his name up. When I saw his name, I thought it was great. Uh, he's got, he's, he's doing a very good job, I think, of working laterally within government that is talking to the Department of Transportation, Interior, and so on to find partnerships so he can increase the economic impact of the agency at a time when it's going to be very, very difficult to get a, a larger appropriation out of Congress. So, you know, he's an ambitious guy. He's used to succeeding. He's entrepreneurial. And, uh, and, and I think he's got, you know, got the, the right attitude. And he's kind of a, you know, he's part of the New York cultural establishment, but he's also, ha he has a very populist uh, persona, yeah. which I think works very well as you have to talk to the yeah. entire country. So I'm, uh, I, it, was an, it was an aggressive, ambitious choice uh, on the part of the administration, and I think it's going to, uh, I think it's going to pay off very well. A question I have for, for each of you, 
Hmm. You know, when I, when I was you know, a, a young person involved with, with arts and culture, arts organization and artists thought about the NEA as one of the things that was in their heads as they were planning events or activities or programs. Do you, when you sit around and say, well, I'm going to do X, is that even a, a consideration? Oh, let's try for an NEA grant. Or has, it, has the size of the agency and sort of it's kind of taken it off the table? I guess I'm a, I've I guess heard I'm of the out. National Endowment for the Arts, and it sounds like you know something I hear as the PSA on NPR or whatever, but mostly like from the 80s. That's my association. Mm -hmm. Do I think about it as a place to get funding? Oh my God, it never crossed my mind. Yeah, right. <laughs> but actually, Thank you. actually, on that note, yeah. there are some things that have happened that have been very really useful for arts organizations. On a flip side, which is um, there's been a bigger emphasis on community work. Yeah. And, and, and regionalism has become an emphasis. And Creative Time works, A, on community-based work and is not just working in New York City, but across the United States. Well, you've been supported. Yeah, exactly. Any, yeah. Okay. So, and those, those two mandates and those yeah. two interests are in some ways very important for us because also, you know, I think it's a very important political lesson that having the arts always speak to an elite New York-based audience is a problem. Right. And so I think that is an important lesson from that time, not just on this kind of reactionary level, but also on a very methodological level that the arts need to speak to everyday people as well. Let me just you bring know? Magda in, and then I want to bring to quest, come yeah. to questions from the audience. But we've talked about government, we've talked about kind of corporations, great uh, line from NATO, government's an accepted lapdog of capital. Um, what about those capitalists? I mean, the other thing we've seen in this era is the... Um, tremendous growth of wealth in the hands of a tiny 0.01% of our population. I think 0.1% has the same income as 120 million of the rest of us. How are those folks as collectors? And how do their priorities and choices um, affect our culture differently from institutions and the quality of the art? Well, they, it's, um, it's quite unfortunate because um, it's a, it's a completely different canon of art that is being uh, self-prepared and, um, and uh, acquired by this highest echelon of capitalism. It's usually incredibly non-adventurous art, very expensive, very sleek. The, um, the efforts to, uh, to uh, change that are not simple, so I, I would think, uh, and at the same time, this is the type of work and the type of production that basically hijacks a conversation about art. How much do you hear about Damien Hirst or Jeff Koons versus how much do you hear about uh, really valid, interesting practices of artists that um, reflect our time in, or the other side of our time. So, uh, not a pretty picture. Mm. All right, let me see, uh, do we have anybody? Not a pretty picture. And, okay, first question here, and Becca, we'll, we'll make sure you get a chance to weigh in here. J yeah. Tell us just your name. Oh, I'm, I'm Eben Fisher, and uh, I wanted to respond to um, a number of things, but I, I love what Martha Wilson said about the, the tennis balls versus the crosses. I thought yeah. that was a beautiful sort of picture of two different communities expressing themselves you know, in, in, in different ways. And um, I think that we are on the verge of a major, wonderful swing. And I can see it sprinkled in this conversation here. I, I, I loved a lot of the things that Becca was saying about uh, a kind of do-it-yourself culture, a street culture. I think all of you were reflecting that too. Um, I, I, but to get back to the, 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 the tennis balls versus the um, crosses, I, I think it's clear that there has been this you know, emptiness that we have to address in the arts. There has been an emptiness that we have gone through, and it's a quite an interesting history, and it's a long one, and I'll try to keep this short. But throughout the 20th century, we were sort of you know, killing off things like God and the gods, you know, first the plural gods and then the singular entity. Um, and um, right now, however, um, I think that we're at the point where 
the religious right, and, and forgive me if anyone who's, who believes in God and is very religious, I, I love you, you're fine, okay? But, um, you know, they are up at the, right at the point where their children are getting really frustrated with their parents. It's a perfect point where there's this kind of intergenerational confusion, okay? And so th this, this doubt is about to set in, and it already has set in. They haven't found God, mm. you know, most of them. One or two, yes, they found something. And they realize that you can't really name that thing. They can't name it. But the people in the arts are extremely good at raw witnessing of nature, of the universe, of the things that are the most important, which is to be totally naked emotionally before the world. We are returning to that. All right. And we can bring that energy to bear on the streets, DIY culture, and it's going to swing back. So we're and on the verge of a ours. swing. It's and, ours. Get excited. And the Meghan McCain's of the world will save us, <laughs> um, and, and others too. Um, I'd love to get people's responses, but folks, come up if you've got questions. Um, are you artists? How the heck do you do it? Ask these folks. They've got some answers. Or at least they've got more questions. Anybody want to respond to that? Do you feel hopeful that the religious right are aging and their children are coming up behind them, or is this a cycle we've seen many, many times? If you ever, if you looked at the uh, promo video for the Insane Clown Posse, you will lose all hope <laughs> about the swing. It's awesome. Uh, There's the a... Juggalos and uh, the Christian right are good friends. There's they got a lot of young movement. members. There's a great book by uh, an economist named uh, Robert William Fogel called The Fourth Great Awakening. And he, he talks about cycles in which Christianity gets very involved in politics in the U.S. setting and then gets pushed back. Mm -hmm. And we're probably at a pushback point now. It's not like, like it was. And so in that sense, I think there's some optimism. I don't think they're, they, the Christian right is not as organized or as scary as it was. Uh, oh, I think they're coming back like crazy, aren't they? No. Yeah. I mean, I was at the Glenn Beck rally and it was like a church picnic. It was written... Uh, you know, they they said it was like a church picnic in the Washington Post, and it no sign. I thought it was brilliant, actually. On again, on Glenn Beck's part, understanding his role as a sort of a stage director, and, and he asked everybody not to bring signs so that he could control the message, right? And that then the press aren't walking around taking pictures of crazies. Um, there there is a really interesting climate right now that requires us to get a lot smarter. I don't celebrate the DIY street stuff. I don't think yeah. that that's very threatening, yeah. to be honest. I, um, I mean, I, I completely agree with what you're saying about, you know, now this very fragmented climate we have versus when things were se centralized, there was a national stage for us to struggle over mm -hmm. the definition of meanings in political context. Yeah. And I also think that it's possible to have a radical reading or a political reading of Jeff Koons or anyone, any piece of culture has a politics to it and that is what we have to fight over not the constant iteration of these like alternative forms but rather understanding political art as being that which uh you know and, and what do we do now like well you you hijack or intervene upon things that do have giant multimedia dollar budgets and really you know big audiences those are the ad campaigns the films the you know, the, the pieces of popular culture or political culture that we can insert ourselves into um, to affect people's understanding of it. And Glenn Beck, you know, like fighting over, and the Tea Party fighting over the meaning of the Founding Fathers. Everyone going to uh, Colonial Williamsburg for these reenactments and cheering them on and fighting over what Jefferson really meant when he said X, Y, Z. That is the best stuff ever. That's a good art movement, you gotta admit. It's enjoyable, right? I don't find them that threatening, actually. The Tea Party will freak a lot of people out, it's good. All right. Come up. Uh, hi, there are no religious nuts in American politics. My God, my God. Yeah. <laughs> um, three, uh, three points very quickly. Uh, I wanted to say something about, uh, uh, by the way, Mr. Ivey, yes, there was a reporter in the room, uh, and in the interest of journalistic objectivity, I think you're a rock star. 
Uh, th that I what? I th and the interest of journalistic objectivity, I think you're a rock star. Do you, do you want to just <laughs> oh, give, give us your name? Rock star. Rock star. Oh, okay. I, 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 want to give star. us your name? Uh, sure. <laughs> my name is Leonard Jacobs. On my I uh, run a <laughs> sorry. I run a blog called the Clyde Fitch Report, which covers arts and politics. And I wanted to make three points very quickly. I promise to be succinct. One, the O.C. Sargent situation was not in a vacuum, and I and I agree with you. I think we should not construe it as having been uh, in a vacuum, but rather part of a sort of a consistent pattern of administration assassination, if you will, and I think we need to just keep that in mind. That's number one. Number two, I think we're dancing around the role of government in funding the arts, and I think we should all take a moment, if you wish to each comment or not comment, on whether the government has any role in funding the arts at all for this reason. Uh, though I sit on the left, and though I consider myself a liberal, I don't think that the government in its current form really has any business having anything to do with the arts, because I think that they will end up mucking up uh, free speech. So that's just a, a bullet. And the third, uh, Mr. Rivey, can you talk about your idea for a cultural EPA? I did some writing on that, and I found that interesting. But my question is, if I rubbed Aladdin's lamp tomorrow and the genie popped out, the genie would be wearing nothing, of course. And the genie said, uh, I grant you your idea of a cultural EPA. How would you specifically make sure that such a uh, governmental forum or public-private entity would not, in fact, by doing its job, uh, interfere with the exercising of uh, the artistic impulse. Well, Got it. I, I'll, I'll answer very, I mean, I'll, you know, that there's, we could have a panel on that, so I won't, I won't, I won't answer it at any length, but to, I would only say that uh, I'm, a, I'm a believer in the need for uh, a Department of Cultural Affairs in the U.S. Uh, I think that it should be assembled the way we assembled the EPA uh, in the late 60s and early 70s, which is plucking certain functions from multiple departments of government and reconfiguring them into a new entity that would deal with cultural diplomacy, uh, copyright, trade and cultural goods, and so on. I think it could be a very exciting agency. And the purpose of it would not be French style to have a Ministry of Culture that would promote sort of a national, a sense of a normative national identity and deal with content, but rather it would look at the system within which art gets created, distributed, consumed, and preserved, and see if that system, which is really a system about media ownership and intellectual property and trade and cultural goods, that, whether that system is properly aligned with public purposes. And I think we could have an agency, by concentrating on the architecture and the engineering of the system, uh, would keep its hands off of content. I think, I, in fact, I think the United States could be the opportunity to be the first country that would get a Department of Cultural Affairs right. In other words, it would not be about content. It would not be about a normative sense of Americanness. It wouldn't be a Lou Dobbs sense of, you know, what, what culture should be. So uh, I, think, I think it's a long process because change like that can only happen if it's based in a, a norm in which lots of, of the American, you know, numbers of the American people believe that it's a good idea. That norm isn't there yet, the way it developed around uh, the, the natural environment in the late 1960s. But I think that's something that it, many of the problems we suffer from today are there because we, uh, we in policy engages culture piecemeal, incoherently, mm -hmm. without concern for the big picture or for unintended consequences. And uh, we, Laura mentioned the Telecom Act of 1996. I mean, nobody knew that changing media ownership and allowing all this consolidation would ruin the record business. Mm -hmm. But it's a fairly obvious unintended consequence when you think through the effect of that kind of policy change. And we do this again and again and again. It also, just to interrupt, brought us Glenn Beck. Because okay. the consolidation of radio, <coughs> he was in crazy morning zoo radio, gave him the kind of national voice mm. that positioned him so that when the current moment came around, he was right there. There were, there were the other questions were pretty good too, but I, they're not for me. Who, who well, one was about free speech and government um, funding, and are they inimical in, in some way? Uh, we touched on that a little bit before, but um, does anybody want to pick up on that again? I just it just occurred to me because I was just thinking one of my battles curatorially is something that's interesting administratively from the government perspective, which is. When someone's talking about artists, I always at Battle Creative Time, I always think, there's not this thing called artists like there used to be. People think there's this thing called, I'm an artist, I'm a, 
you know, I'm a geographer, I'm a this. Well, everyone, you know, American society, global society are a world of cultural producers at this point. Yeah. This idea of cultural production is not just a specific kind of identity. This, I'm an artist, I have this visionary. Everybody is in some ways, a lot of people are involved in cultural production. But really, everybody is an artist? Well, and to some degree. People are taking videos, everyone's a maker, everyone's kind of more literate with culture. And I think that this kind of, I mean, what I mean to say is that to talk about the arts as a section of society that's not integrated with energy or infrastructure, right? <laughs> BP is a cultural thing as much as it is an energy producer. To extract culture from these things is, I think, to some degree, an antiquated idea uh, based on an economy that wasn't producing culture is in relation to infrastructure. So it's like, I just think it's a really difficult battle because culture is in everything we do at this point. And this idea that it's just a segment over here is different. I just think it's so radically different. Does anybody I, I, want to I detest take the word, NATO the word that? culture is not, is not useful. It's not useful. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe somebody out there wants to challenge. I would certainly say from an experiential point of view, I feel as if artists keep themselves more removed from political engagement than in other times in our lives. Not all of them, but some of them. It goes both ways. It feels to me as if we have often the political culture that you talked about, NATO, yeah. that keeps itself away from artists. And then there are also artists who don't want to get too involved in politics. Yeah, but there's a lot of political work that doesn't look political. And I think in this day and age, that's probably more effective political work than that which sort of smacks of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm trying to stir things up. It's not working. All right, somebody else um, here. Um, Stand up I, and give us your name. Sure, my name is William Heath. Um, Rebecca, I think you're really interesting and wily schizophrenic character. And <laughs> I think you operate from a lot of different positions that don't make any sense together. And I think it's a really sexy and seductive methodology. Um, awesome. I'm really curious, not Rebecca. To Are answer. you being obscene? No, not at all. Um, I think. Porn if, pays. I'm curious what the other panelists think your hats are. Um, or might be, or maybe something you had tonight. I'm also curious if you're not DIY, why are you in Brooklyn, and why does your storefront look the way it looks? <laughs> We're rebranding. It's <laughs> funny. That, that, is that an interesting, I mean, does anybody want to pick up on that? How do people on the panel perceive Becca's various hats? <laughs> or heads? She seems no? very right. modern to me. I, it's very modern. <laughs> I like it. All right. Um, here. This. Well, what, can I just, I'll speak to that. Okay. Because I'm like about to blush or something. Um, uh, I mean, you're right. I guess it, that's why I, I, I um, wrote the panel curators and was like, can we please start with a presentation? Like, can we each have a five or 10 minute PowerPoint presentation? Because I feel like this format makes it really hard to weave. And in general, like, that's why I hate grant applications, because there's a vocabulary that's so specific and regimented and normalized. And, I, and it's really hard to weave some complex uh, things together when you know we're I, we're in a completely different world than we were three four years ago, right? I think so. I mean, I think the, yeah. the media landscape has shifted so dramatically that we need new language and we need new methodologies and tactics. So uh, one hat is, yeah, I'm a grassroots field organizer and I've worked in radical environments with anarchists and anti-capitalists. I've worked in the NGO world. I've worked in the UN and, uh, and I, you know, and then I, I run an art space which began at trying to use the vocabulary of DIY and collage and street art and political art as an attempt to intervene upon and affect that scene, now we're rebranding. Like to me, what becomes interesting is to take on the mantle of the institution, the vocabulary, whatever, of that which you want to affect. Because, you know, when I work for an NGO, yeah, I can criticize them from the outside, but once you represent it, you are it. So you can affect it. So I feel like this whole inside outside is no longer especially relevant in this day and age where we have such a great degree of fragmentation. And we made a strategic error. Bella Lewitsky, remember, refused her grant back in the very beginning of the culture wars. Uh, we never refused any grants because we don't believe there is such a thing as obscene art 
as soon as we left, let that point get won by the other side, we were then suddenly in a defensive mm -hmm. position. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. That's right. That's right. Questions? Two more. Yeah. Oh, okay. no, you were first. I do think you were first. All right. Yeah, I know. I, I wanted to make a comment about something that was from several minutes ago. Um, but I find, um, in listening to this whole conversation, okay, I agree with that. No, I agree with that. <laughs> sort of like, you know, I'm running to that side. Now I'm running to that side. And, you know, over the decades where you've had this experience with multiple events and you know people and, and you have your own personal um, practice as an artist, I think one of the things that really frustrates me, and also, by the way, I have my students here. They are half your audience, but... <laughs> <laughs> a lot of students over there, but I feel like, okay, so then in my teaching, okay, that hat as a teacher, I find myself always at some point during the class becoming political because I do think that being engaged in culture is intrinsically political, right? Whether you're being, you know, just in just as the act in itself. But I, so I always find myself veering in that direction and then I have to cut myself up short and apologize. You know, I'm sorry I'm being political. But there was, you know, there is this also this understanding that to be culturally involved is intrinsically political. It's inevitable. So your question, and this is what I wanted to address when you were talking about the arts and politics. So I do have, at times I wear the hat of an activist. And I find within that world that the visual arts is, you know, it has, you know, it's fine in the service of propaganda or poster making, but that it's really not given sort of free reign. It gets dissed that way. And that's because of what NATO said, you know, it's attachment to bourgeois elite commodification. But so I'm saying, so I'm confused, I'm over there, I'm over there. But the one thing I can say is that when I was in my early 20s, I got an individual NEA. And it was the first time in my life that I had money to work for a year on what I wanted. It was the first time I got a studio, it was the first time I was actually able to make things the right size, and it, was a, it made a significant, significant difference for me personally as an artist and those that doesn't exist anymore and i think that that is at a great loss and disservice for a type of cultural identity that that we had and we don't have anymore and when you talk about this to the kids to the students now they're not kids they're in their 20s they're they're young adults they don't know what I'm talking about because they don't have it. Right. It's not in the vernacular of what's possible. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that's very sad mm -hmm. and it doesn't speak well for, for our culture that we don't provide that, that type of free space. Maybe this would be a good time to mention next week's panel. It's going to feature, among others, Holly Hughes, who was one of the NEA4, um, Carolee Schneeman, Trevor Paglin, Wafa Bilal, all individual artists who will talk, I think, a little bit about how their, experience, their lives have changed and their work has been affected by all this. I don't know whether anybody wants to weigh in on that. How about we take the next question and then we have some closing comments from everybody addressing well, those questions. Maybe I just say one thing, which is... Uh, I, I don't think NEA is one and only, and there's nothing else existing as an option for individual grants out there. So um, it, it's, it certainly does reflect on the country and the culture that it is not um, supporting individual artists, but there are other grants that one can apply for. Hi, I'm Liz Crane. My question revolves around the consumption of art and the fact that we haven't really been talking about, and I use consumers sort of intentionally, but what the government's role, I mean, we're asking whether the government should be funding content as opposed to whether the government should be encouraging the 
education of the value of art you know, versus the actual presenting content. And I think one thing that the mainstream arts organizations are actually doing better in some way is through these partnerships that, you know, Rachel Goslins and Rocco Landsman and all of these, these people are making with the Department of Transportation and the Livability Act, their, their goal is both to use the arts to promote social change, but also to make the arts something that's accepted and that's part of everybody's life. And when I hear people talk about censorship, I feel like it's much more about getting people to to sort of, you know, shocking them into agreeing with you as opposed to somehow, um, you know, reaching out and trying to create a larger consumer base so that the issue of censorship isn't coming from the top down as much as it is, you know, coming from the bottom up. So how can you, how can you actually go out and change the consumer field, not in terms of the political and, you know, getting across some political point, but actually in terms of developing new consumers that may be more likely to, you know, be open to what's considered obscene, but is obviously not obscene art. Mm -hmm and whether the government want to should ever roll in that more than, you know. So cultivating the value of art as a societal value, as well as individual art and artists. Right. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Felix Reutan fired all the art teachers in New York in 1975 to avoid bankruptcy of the city. Then the not-for-profit sector, Franklin Furnace, Creative Time, and other organizations what are we going to do? We stepped in and started education programs, and in in the you know the debates in the education field are are uh, too numerous to mention here. But it would be my goal in running a little education program to make art invisible, really, to make it just natural and part of life, and not mm -hmm. that special or stuck over there. Is it significant that such a big part, portion of the audience we have here is one professor's class? <laughs> no, I mean, 20 years ago, I think we would have had a pretty packed room. Yeah. Has that something to do with the place that culture occupies now? No, I, well, just to say, first of all, I'm convinced that um, culture writ large has a much bigger audience yeah. than ever. The idea that like, people do not appreciate culture is crazy. I mean, and like the arts are not hurting in the in the United States. I mean, the arts kind of in a broadly defined way has mass viewership base, museums, like forget this just the arts thing, but just people get it. I think the difference is it's a two end it's two two way street. One thing is institutions in the United States need to speak a language of culture that actually matters to people, right? Because what happens with these refined ideas of taste that is the kind of result of privatization of nonprofits, is that increasingly the ivory tower of arts is trying to get away. The whole aesthetic is based on anti-populism, right? It is based on its lack of popularity. So a lot of contemporary art museums basically hate its public. So <laughs> this, is, this is a contradiction, right? So you know, one of the ideas of teaching people about art is to teach people like to like things that hate them, this is not the right way to go. The, the, the more appropriate way is to find a kind of aesthetic, you know, co institutions to produce a kind of space of meaning through culture in the visual cultural language that is in fact popular. Mm. It's not art like it used to be. It's not paintings and video and sculpture. Culture is a thing that everybody's eating and digesting. And I think also visual literacy programs and critical thinking through media is a much more productive way to think about approaching the arts than trying to teach kids why rich people's houses are what they should have. Yeah, I know I have the mic. Let's look at it. Let's, let's, we're, we're, we're coming to the end of our time here, and I want to give people a chance to give some closing comments. And I also want Bill um, to comment on one thing in our timeline here. Uh, many of you may have read this excellent handout from our, the, the, the sponsors of the event. Um, it does talk about the, color of the, the story of Colors story. It also mentions an Arthur Dong documentary film, um, Family Fundamentals, Profiling Families with Gay Adult Children. The grant been recommended by the agency's media arts panel, and it was rejected by you. So this is your chance to explain it for people or talk about it. Um, Always enjoyable. 
I won't go into as much detail as I did with the, uh, with the book, but it's, it's a similar but not as elaborate uh, situation. Uh, this is a, now I'm, I'm remembering, this is a decade ago, the, uh, this was a proposal for a film on the families of, uh, of gay and lesbian uh, young people. And the issue, uh, the, the, the subject was how, do, how are families dealing with, uh, with, with this? And, 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 and the idea was to look at, at prominent, highly visible families and, uh, and kind of get some kind of, a, uh, of an ecology. And, uh, and there was a list of eight or 10 families that they were going to deal with. And I'm looking down the list. And right in the middle, it's Lynn and Dick Cheney. <laughs> And, uh, and I said to, we, this was, was a staff meeting, I said, well, gosh, you know, the, the, the panel said that everybody in this list had agreed to participate. And I said, that really surprises me, because the Cheneys have been very clear that they have a wonderful relationship with their daughter. The fact that she's gay is not a public matter. They're not going to discuss it. And I said, I'm just really surprised that they're going to participate in this film. Well, as when we really started then to dig into the application, aha, they hadn't agreed. There were three of the eight or ten families that were going to be featured with interviews. The others were going to be treated in the film, but were not, had not given permission, or had not agreed to participate. And I sat there and I said, and, I, and you know, there, at this point, I was a, a lame duck chairman. I was, I was still chairman, but it was, I was in the Bush Cheney administration. And I said, I'm just not going to put the NEA in the position of funding a film that, in a sense, takes on the vice president's family in, in a way that they have already said they don't want done. I'm just not going to do that because that's all you're going to talk about for the next two, three, four, or six months. So that's why I, I said we're not going to fund it. And the panel, when they approved it, was under the impression that all of the listed subjects had agreed to participate. So just as in the case of Los Colores, there was a difference between what the panel approved mm -hmm. and what the final product was going to be. And I don't think there was necessarily an attempt to deceive mm -hmm. uh, the, the panel or, or, or deceive the endowment, but it was, it was not as clear as it should have been do that, you, that, that that was the case. So that's why I did As we continue to fight around definitions of family, yeah. do you wish that at that time the NEA had given its sign of approval to that inquiry? No. For, I mean, my, my reasoning was never about the merit of the project. It was always about the impact of funding the project on the agency. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my job was not to push the agency toward encouraging cutting edge or controversial work. It was to advance the enterprise. And so that was always the basis for me. Who wants to go first with closing thoughts, comments, encouragement perhaps to artists out there or collectors? Well, I just want to take on NATO a little bit because I think this uh, extreme view of cultural institutions uh, versus uh, everybody is a culture product producer is is kind of extreme i think there's room for both you uh, just like you cannot explain heisenberg principle in two sentences there is an art that is complex complicated difficult and it does take time and it does take huge effort to follow and with a lot of them you know at the end of this stick it's a carrot it's very good, and uh, and then there is a, you know there is projects that are kind of much more accessible, and the institutions I think are often doing not an awful job. If you see, you know, you have to elbow yourself uh, into MoMA on a weekend uh, for Marina Abramovic show. It's not, um, you know, it's not. Uh, what I think would have um, happened a few years ago. At the same time, you have an incredibly dumbing uh, strategies of institutions where, uh, you know, a Brooklyn museum is showing junk art from a game show winner or yeah. something. Um, so spectrum is big. And the other part that I would also say um, that that 
that the, the mainstream versus the social media is another mm. difference in the landscape of approach and understanding, interpretation, and discussion about ours at this point. NATO. <laughs> what? <laughs> the, NATO. The, <laughs> that art? Yeah, that's a beautiful show. NATO, you want to share some? Yeah, well, it, it's tricky because I think that, um, yes, institutions are doing, I mean, you know, okay, good job moment with Marina Bravich. It's a great show. She's, you know, I mean, it's not particularly new work, right? Um, you know, it's performance work from the late 60s and early 70s, or in 2010. But I think it is dramatic that the institutions didn't. That work actually seems very fresh today in a strange sense. But what I think is important in terms of the kind of, what I'm trying to say is that it's very difficult to produce a language around cultural production today in a world where the arts no longer have the corner on the market on the language nor the skill sets. And we can no longer use the historical analysis and tools germane just to that field in order to, in to, in order to explain what's interesting about cultural production. Mm -hmm. So it is, you know, it's a two-way street. There are a lot of tools that are important for students of art to learn, but there's also a lot of tools about everyday life that's culture that institutions need to learn. And, um, and that's, I think, a very tricky thing because I think everybody wants to I know from an inside perspective in the arts and from the whole infrastructure, from grantors to magazines to institutions, that pretty much people would prefer the arts to still have the language of the mid 20th century. Mm. Becca? Um, yeah, I'm gonna sound schizophrenic again. <laughs> but, I, but I also sort of um, took, not, took issue with what you said, Nato, that because it's, it's a little dangerous if it's reduced to we need more populist art, right? Or we need to, like our art institutions need to be um, dumbed down. <laughs> like that not, I mean, to me the goal isn't make art and culture accessible, teach everybody how to make video. It's, that's great, I'm glad you can. Um, you know, we're, I, I, we're I feel like it's a problem that inside and outside have collapsed. And that uh, in part of me longs for the days when it was really clear uh, it, where your battle lines were drawn because then you could rally the troops, you know? And that's why the right is doing a really good job because Obama and the left are in power. And, uh, you know, there's nothing like a clearly defined enemy. I don't know about um, the left being in power. Yeah, well, um, no, but I mean, I think that uh, just this extension of like, it's no longer big A art, everybody's little A art, and it's culture, culture, you know, it's like... Um, is accurate. Is, is accurate, but, you know, there's a bit of a problem, and it becomes a, you know, a problem for, it's, I just look at artists and, and um, really radical political work being done by artists in other countries that I feel is, like, a hell of a lot smarter and just unfundable here. Um, because of this notion that we have to make everything really accessible. Is that really what we should aim for? Or, we sh or should we aim for shifting like NEA and uh, foundation grants, that whole culture, so that you, know, you don't have to take a, a, out every three syllable mm. word. You know, anything that sounds like theory has to be like removed from so many yeah, of your grant but just applications. Be careful on the we have flip an anti-intellectual strain right, here. <laughs> Whereas like other countries support their intellectuals and support culture in service of of uh, of a politics and a, and a robust critical environment of engaged citizenry. Does this take us back to the decency clause or what does any of this have to do with the decency clause bill and then Martha bill and then Martha um. Well, I think the decency clause has come to seem a little quaint. I mean, the, the NEA could, if you talk about respect for diverse beliefs and values, use that language to justify a new round of controversial grant making. I mean, you could make a grant for an exhibition in, in an Islamic cultural center in lower Manhattan based on respect for diverse beliefs and values. So the, the, the notion that the language has 
shifted meaning that much is, uh, is, is, is interesting and significant. I'm, I also would note that if I had presented my, you know, Cinco Puntos Press uh, 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 slideshow uh, seven or eight years ago, I would have been, you know, viciously attacked for, the, for having made that decision. And I think there's much more passivity today around uh, what I would call kind of a managerial approach to arts funding. And I think that's one way that the, that the arts can, uh, can still flourish in a federal setting if they uh, work on community and some of the things that NATO was talking about as their primary goal. I think it's important to remember that most arts organizations, we've alluded to this, NATO and Becca have both alluded to it, most arts organizations in the US are for profit. Most artists work in a for-profit environment. If you're a visual artist in, the, in New York City, you've got to worry about a for-profit gallery system. You don't have to worry about the NEA. This is also true of uh, writers. They mostly work in a for-profit environment. So the health of that environment is critical to the way artists and arts organizations do. So I, I think the two things that I worry about are the increasing consolidation of, uh, of, of, of the media and the larger environment for, uh, uh, in which art gets made and distributed. Mm -hmm. And then the related outsourcing of censorship. Uh, Martha early on talked about uh, the fact that, uh, uh, you know, that, that in, in a sense she'd seen a, an example of censorship that came from a corporation. The problem is the First Amendment doesn't apply to corporations. Mm -hmm. There's no restriction on a corporation uh, controlling speech or content. Mm -hmm. And so as a government has given various entities out there through the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and other laws and regulations, the authority to, uh, in a sense, regulate content, uh, we, we, we basically have a kind of outsourced de facto segregation and the target needs to really shift from government censorship, which I think is not that significant a factor, to this de facto violation of, of the principle, the spirit of the First Amendment by a increasingly powerful merged uh, corporate sector from which we seem to accept a pretty high level of oversight, uh, control, and uh, limitation on, on, on our actions. You know, to me, I'll say one last. If I were to say today that I'm going to produce a film, a series for a television network with, a, with the working title, all of the great rock and roll performances of all time, from the beginning of rock and roll to the present. That's not an achievable artistic vision because it could not be licensed. Mm. And there's something wrong with a system of intellectual property and copyright in which a very legitimate, sure. very obvious uh, artistic vision could not be realized because of the mm. architecture of our cultural mm. system. Mm -hmm. Martha. I'm nostalgic for the day when government used to support the wild and crazy artists yeah of the 70s, and so the most exciting thing I heard all night was this idea of creating an agency by pulling copyright together with transportation together. So, uh, are you in charge? No, 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 I'm in charge of the argument. I'm not in charge of the agency. Well, I want to thank everybody and encourage you all to go and check out the uh, websites and the work of everybody represented here. Pick up one of these flyers. It'll also remind you of the panel next week, same time, same place, Wednesday, September 22nd. Wafa Bilal, Holly Hughes, Trevor Paglin, Carolee Schneeman, and I'll be back. Look forward to seeing you there. Bring your friends. Thanks. Thank you.